Welcome, my name is Chip Dodd. I teach Geography and International Studies here at Shoreline Community College. And it is my pleasure to introduce a former student of mine uh, and two, uh, 2011, uh, 2011 graduate of Shoreline, Dan DeMay. Uh, occasionally, we invite back some of our recent graduates to talk about their life after Shoreline, which often involves more schooling and a few changes um, and an interesting career path. Uh, Dan uh, left a well-paying job to pursue a career in journalism, which he considers essential to democracy. Uh, however, in a world experiencing information revolution, it is not easy to find and then keep your footing in that profession. So we're gonna hear something about that today. Uh, Dan covers business and transportation for the Seattle PI online newspaper. Uh, before joining the web-only PI organization, uh, Dan covered business at the Bozeman Daily Chronicle in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, did you like Bozeman? Loved it. Okay. <laughs> Prior to that, he covered government and politics at the Skagit Valley Herald in Mount Vernon, Washington. Uh, while a student at Shoreline, Daniel held several roles on the Ed, Ebtide staff, including editor-in-chief for more than one year. Take away Dan's career in journalism has already taken him to four newspapers in a relatively brief amount of time. Uh, I cannot say for sure what he has in his eye next, but Dan was recently seen coming out of a the theater where The Post was playing. Okay. Um, Dan studied journalism at the University of Missouri uh, and holds a bachelor's degree from Western Washington University. Uh, and I might point out one other thing that, uh, uh, and Dan, I don't know if you're going to speak to this, but he is also uh, a musician, um, perhaps a rock and roll artist. Uh, so uh, Dan is a very um, multifaceted individual. Um, a couple housekeeping items, um, if I may mention a couple uh, items before turning things over to Dan. Emergency exits, exits are in the back of the room where you entered on the side here, so there's really three. So uh, get yourself situated for uh, an emergency exit, look at those exits. Um, we are recording this event for later viewing, so during the question and answer session, please raise your hand and somebody will bring the uh, microphone over to you. So that'll facilitate hearing the questions. So uh, it'll be less disorienting. Uh, before you leave, please take a moment to give us some feedback on the survey that is in your program. Now, please uh, join me in welcoming Dan DeMay to Shoreline Community College. Thanks, Chip. Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, thanks, Chip, for the great introduction, and Larry for, uh, for setting this up. And uh, I'm going to be a little off the cuff here. Larry had asked me if I wanted to do a PowerPoint or something, and I'm not really a PowerPoint kind of guy, so I've got some clips to kind of uh, put up on the screen as we go through and talk about how journalism unfolded for me. But I figured it'd probably be good to start with uh, kind of my path to, to journalism, which is that I was not, I, I didn't really plan on being a journalist when I, uh, you know, a couple years before I came to Shoreline. Uh, I was uh, 27 years old when I decided that I wanted to go to college. I had dropped out of high school when I was 16 and got my GED and I had worked as a carpenter. I had worked as a uh, music, music producer, sound producer at a production company. I worked for a while making passes, like backstage passes for a company based out of Port Townsend. Uh, I, uh, I, I played in bands. I worked in electric motor shop for several years, uh, rewinding uh, up to 2,000 horsepower electric motors, which can be about as big as this corner of the room. So uh, kind of some different things under my belt. I wound up back doing uh, drywall and construction. I was doing steel stud framing. I was building buildings like this. I worked on the convention center in downtown Seattle at one point. Uh, and I started getting a little bit burned out. And one day, my work partner and I on the way in, he woke up. It was about you know five in the morning on the drive in. And he said, 
what the hell are we doing this for? What, what's the point? And I said, I don't know, man. I, I really don't know why. And we had sort of been tossed around from a couple different jobs. We were driving a couple hours to get to work, making pretty good money, but uh, not really feeling the, the goodness of it. And which is not to say there's anything wrong with it, the trades. Uh, so, so don't take that the wrong way. But uh, so I said, yeah, why? Screw it. Let's go home. So we took the next exit, got off the highway, and we went home. And uh, we were both members of the local carpenters union at the time, so we were able to do that without being totally left out on our butts. We took what was called a voluntary layoff. And uh, I said, I think it's time to go to college. I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure it out. So I knew I couldn't go to a four-year university because I was a high school dropout with a, a sub 2.0 GPA when I left high school. Uh, so I said, all right, I'm going to apply to some community colleges. So I went to, I think, college boards and just put in an application for, it's probably my phone, I'm sorry. Uh, put in an application for several community colleges, uh, Shoreline Olympic, Peninsula, uh, I don't know where else. Anyway, uh, of course, got in because they're not as picky as four years about who they let in. I was, had a good application and whatnot. And I decided to go to Shoreline. I was still living in Port Townsend, and, uh, which is where I grew up. And I wanted to get out of my comfort zone. I wanted to go somewhere where I would be in an entirely new environment to me, around people I had never been around before, with more diversity and more challenges, and trying to figure it all out. So I decided to go to Shoreline. I uh, didn't have a job. I, I did this, uh, this one last job as a contractor. I drywalled this big house. And I took the money, and I paid six months worth of rent. And I packed up some stuff in the back of my buddy's truck, and I moved to Shoreline and started school, not really knowing what was going to happen. And about two weeks in, I went uh, into the ebb tide, and I said, hey, I want to write some stories for you guys. And, um, and they let me write a story, and uh, that took me down this path of journalism. And to back up a little bit, my choice to do that, to study journalism, was definitely made before I entered college. I, I had followed the 2008 presidential election really closely. I had been reading the Seattle PI, the, as it was the post Intelligencer still then. I had been following it uh, in national news sources, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, Newsweek, watching on TV, really excited by the whole thing. There was a lot of excitement. Uh, I was, you know, I was still a late 20-something at the time, feeling like, wow, things are, this is really cool, this is exciting. And I really wanted to have a role in, in telling that story. I felt like this is an important story and all of these stories about how America is changing and what's happening. And I thought, I'd love to write. I'd always loved to write. I'd been interested in writing since I was uh, in elementary school. I had gone to the Young Writers Conferences and that kind of thing. So I said, journalism seems like the way to go. Uh, not knowing really at the time what I was in for in terms of uh, uh, career stability and uh, how much money might be able to make and what kind of jobs might be available because that was really uh, when, it wasn't when it started, but it was certainly when Steam started to pick up on the unraveling of digital advertising and that kind of thing which have, has led to all kinds of changes in the industry. So I get to Shoreline, I start on the ebb tide and do you want to put this up? And I write this story. This is the first story I wrote and had published in any newspaper uh, about Obama's education plan. And uh, I read it last night again, and I said, oh, boy, I could have used a good edit on that. Uh, but you know, also, not so bad. And I had editors who, who helped shepherd me through this process. But then it was, I, they said, hey, do you want to stick around and help us put the paper together? We usually stay up late and we edit things and we, we proofread and, and we do all that stuff. And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, I got nothing going on. And I stayed till about 3.30 in the morning down in the ebb tide office working on the paper with these people I had only just met. And I, w I loved it. I, I loved every minute of it. I was like, these are the kind of people I want to be around. This is the kind of stuff I want to be doing. This is what I'm interested in. And that was pretty much the beginning of the end for me with journalism. Uh, very quickly, there was a need for a distribution manager, someone to go put the papers around the campus. And I said, sure, I'll take that. 
and I started writing more and uh, soon a copy editor role opened up and I was able to step into that and so uh, very quickly got, got in over my head uh, at Shoreline. Um, can you put up the second, maybe the second link? Very early on, uh, I got to cover some, uh, some politics, I guess. It's campus politics, it's politics, so. Uh, and uh, this, this was really funny, not haha, -ha, but odd coincidence. The prior issue to this, I had gone to the cosmetology program and done this whole uh, project about the program and how great it was. And I let them like dye my hair and do all, give me a facial, all this stuff. And I was so excited, I was like, wow, this is this cool program. And then a couple weeks later, they say, it, it's done, we're gonna get rid of it. Uh, but this kind of stuff got me really interested. I was like, this is stuff that hits home to this entire campus community and to the broader community, people who work here, who live in the community. And so this is kind of a, cuts to Shoreline were very commonplace at the time. It was an era of cutting, cutting, cutting to education. Uh, the Great Recession was just getting underway. Uh, so. This got me really interested in, in writing about these kind of issues, and it really started me down this path of, uh, I'm interested in issues, not just as an issue, but how they impact people, how they impact you, or you, or you, or you, what that, what that does to your personal life. And it may not, I, I probably didn't tell it very well at the time, but certainly today, when I'm telling this kind of story, I wanna know what happens to the people on the ground. I don't care, I mean, I care what happens in, at City Hall or at the state legislature, but uh, how do these things impact people on the ground? And so that has really shaped a lot of what I've done uh, since then. You wanna go to third link? See what this is? See if I remember my order. So I was at Shoreline for uh, a while, two and a half, two and a half years, something like that. I had moved into editor-in-chief, I ran the newspaper, I um, loved it. I, I spent many, many, many hours in the newspaper. I left classes early to go work on the newspaper. I stayed here late. Uh, so I decided when I uh, graduated from Shoreline that I'd go to the University of Missouri. And uh, they've got a great journalism program and I thought, sure, that, that sounds like that'll work out fine. And I went there and I got to work writing for the, the Maneater, which is their strangely named student newspaper. And uh, it's, like, it's like from the 30s, some sort of, they thought it was a clever way to say, like, we'll, we'll, we'll eat people up. That's how hard hitting we are uh, today, I, you know, without much explanation. I was like, that's a weird newspaper name. It's a Hall of Notes song, isn't it? Also, also, yeah. So uh, at Missouri, I did one semester at Missouri, and I was like, There's, this is not the place for me. College was fine, I had a great time with my professors, good classes, uh, took a history class with this guy, it was just wonderful, uh, really focused on the Johnson administration, and I learned some things and got some interest in some politics that I never would have, but did not want to live in Missouri. I was, I turned 30 years old at that point, and I was like, you know, I've put my time in, I've lived places, I've worked places I didn't want to for long periods of time. This is about you know, being where I want to be and doing what I want to do and making it count. And so I transferred to Western Washington University and, uh, and got to work there. And I, you want to go to the, the next link? And uh, I had a really great, great time in the program there. Got uh, really involved right away with the journalism program there and uh, taking classes. And I was able to very quickly get a story published in the first uh, like professional publication, which was out of a reporting class, which was just, I was covering, we had to cover these neighborhoods in this class. And it was an interesting assignment because you, everyone gets, you, you basically draw a neighborhood out of a bucket and everyone gets this neighborhood and they go to the community meetings and they cover it really intensely and they try to come up with stories and I think you have to write a story every week or something. And uh, I got this industrial neighborhood where nobody lived. And so I was like, what the heck am I going to do with this neighborhood? And so. I just went out and I just started going to these different businesses I saw and saying, what are you guys doing? What's interesting? What's new? And it turned out that these guys were like the first, uh, they were going to be the first organic and they were the first, uh, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for now? Fair trade. Fair trade. 
Yes, fair trade, but also, no. It's on their bags and I just can't, anyway. They were the, the first in the country uh, of chicken feed to, to go down this road and, and they were gonna be the first organic, all organic chicken feed. And, uh, and they're just hanging out in this weird industrial neighborhood in Bellingham. And this woman had started this just feeding her own chickens in her backyard. So it was this interesting story about their, their boom. And it fed into, again, this sort of community-focused journalism, right, that I, I care about, or I, I write about things that people care about that matter to them that are impacting their community. This is, you know, it made a few jobs, but it also was feeding this sort of burgeoning industry about this new market for different kinds of chicken feed and other animal feed, so, so it's kind of interesting. Um, go, to, go to the next one. So uh, at Western, I, uh, I of course took lots of classes. I worked on the, oh, that's probably not, oh well, we'll get there. Yeah, you'll have to skip that survey. Right down, scroll down to the bottom of the survey. Oh, right there, skip survey, yeah. Uh, Google surveys are great. Uh, this will, we'll get to this in a sec. So I went to work on the Western Front uh, newspaper there, which is another interesting name for a newspaper, a little better, I think, than the Maneater. Uh, I, as a reporter there, it was interesting. So I'd been on the uptide here and I had sort of, even as an editor, although I had a lot of other duties, I'd struggle to get a couple stories done every other week for a newspaper. I'm like, whew, this is a real struggle. And then I was in that reporting class and I gotta get one done every week. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of hard, but it's getting a little easier. Well, I got to the Western Front and I started writing three to five stories a week. My news editor said, hey, you, you can get this done. And then I was just on call all the time. Um, and ah, that's the story I wanted to put up. So, so one of the stories, I was just talking to Larry about this yesterday, when the Skagit River Bridge collapsed, the, the I-5 bridge, uh, I was at home barbecuing and my news editor called and said, hey, I think we need to get down there. This seems like this is gonna be a big deal. And so I went down there and, and covered that and that was kind of interesting. That was my first time interacting with the governor and the secretary of transportation and uh, Chief Batiste to the Washington State Patrol and so it was uh, kind of a like, whoa, thrust into this very big story that's a big regional story. And we had one of the first uh, stories uh, out about it. The Sketch Valley Herald had some, had some uh, inner drama with a former photographer, uh, bless his soul. And so there was some weird fighting there. And so we had one of the first stories uh, about this that really covered some of the depth. And uh, I think we won some awards for that coverage too. But uh, it really got me further into this I love journalism, it's important and I care about it and so forth. So then I entered the Sketch Valley Herald uh, as maybe my first week, I'm sure it was my first week as an intern, the farm workers at Sakuma Brothers Farms decided to go on strike. And the business reporter was out that day, so they said, hey Dan, can you go out and see what this thing is about? And it turned into this story that I covered for the next two years. And uh, this was one, one big story that I wrote just a few weeks after it started that actually won, I think I won an award for, so that was kind of cool, but uh, really was thrust into this very complicated issue where these migrant workers who are, uh, are largely uh, Miztec and, um, and Oaxacan uh, uh, natives, they travel up from Mexico, they, they work in California, they come up, they work in Washington, and they were kind of getting a raw deal out there, but it was so much more complicated than that. It wasn't just the farmers are, are taking advantage of them. They're sort of, they've got some issues of their own with how they're trying, they're working with an outside group and they're kind of trying to stir up a little more trouble than maybe the farmer wants and the farmers are immigrants themselves. And so you've got this like issue where it just kind of became more and more and more. So I spent, uh, so I was an intern at Skagit and then I wrote a column for Skagit when I went back to school in the fall. And then in the winter they said, Dan, we want you to go to the Capitol and cover the state legislature. So I packed up my things and I moved to Olympia for two and a half months and uh, for n almost no money. And they said I was an intern, but uh, ended up just sort of calling in every day and, and here's the three or four stories I'm gonna do. And at that point I'm writing three or four stories a day pretty regularly and sort of in the, so it's all been building up to this point of like, wow, I'm producing all this work. And so that ended and I was kind of hanging out. I had moved back to Bellingham and I get a call a week and a half later from the government reporter who says, hey Dan, I'm gonna quit. So 
you might get a call. And lo and behold, about 20 minutes later, the editor called and offered me a job. And so I went to work at the Sketch Valley Herald. You can go to the next one. Uh, as uh, I wasn't quite out of college yet, but uh, pretty close. It was my last quarter. And I got to do some really interesting work there. My, my role was, uh, was government and politics reporter, but I covered a lot of issues. Uh, this is one of the last stories I wrote for the Skagit Valley Herald, actually. Uh, we did a really extensive series about the mental health system in Skagit County. Uh, and this is at the time that they were, uh, there, was, there were some recent decisions about um, involuntary holds in hospitals and how that could be done. And you know, this issue is very complex and it cover, affects all our communities. So it was a great thing to get my toes into because there are things that I, talk, that I covered in this that I take into many other stories I write about. Uh, you can go ahead and go to whatever's next. Um, I also dug into a, a water rights issue in Skagit County where a Supreme Court ruling had revealed, well, it didn't reveal, but it basically set out that I think, uh, I forget the exact number now, uh, but thousands of parcels of land in rural Skagit County had no right to water. And imagine you own a piece of land where you have no right to water. You, have, you can get water, you can put a well in, you know there's water there, and you can go ahead and put a well in, but you can't use that for yourself. You can use it for, uh, oh, that's not it, but we'll get there. Uh, you can use it for watering your lawn, you can use it for watering animals, but you can't use it for a house. And so it was this really, again, this complicated issue. I was reading all these uh, US Geological Survey reports and digging into all these complicated things, and you know, it's stuff that 10 years ago I would have said, oh, this is so boring. What is, I'm reading this report, and what does this matter, and it's all this legalese. But at that point, I'm, you know, I had these people who are trying to build a house, and they're like, they put in a well, and they want to build a house. And so I'm like, I'm, I'm going to take this thing that nobody wants to read, and I'm going to turn it into something that, boil it down to the bare essentials, and this is why they can't build a house, and these are the issues. And it was, it turned out to be really, Impactful. You can. Uh, how about uh, water fight? Oh, is that not working? Oh, okay. Well, uh, oh, I see that. Well, that's all right. Just go to the high tech on the high line. That's fine. So, uh, spend some time at Skagit. Uh, uh, what was it? A about a year and a half, all told, with internships and so forth. And then I decide uh, it's time to go. I got to get out of here. So I head to Bozeman, the Bozeman Daily Chronicle, to be a business reporter. I was not there very long, about seven months. But in my time, I got to do some really interesting stuff. Uh, this is probably the highlight of my work there. Uh, I spent about four months investigating this nonprofit up in uh, rural Montana in this little town called Harlem. And I had been just combing through more boring stuff, da uh, database for labor certifications, when I saw this uh, 44 or some number of labor certifications for these highly paid H-1B workers up in this little tiny town. And I said, that's really weird. What, is there a tech center up there? Is there something I don't know about? So I made some calls, and nobody knew anything about it. And pretty soon, I found this web of nonprofits and companies that were hiring each other. And all the same people sat on all the same boards. And the reservation that was supposed to get the benefit of this thing knew nothing about it. And ev when I went up there to talk to people, everyone in town said, this guy's a scammer. He's a con man. And so uh, I wrote this big story about it and uh, this triggered a state investigation in Montana uh, by the state attorney general and then uh, just last year one of the guys involved with this was uh, convicted of visa fraud in federal court for another uh, another case and it s seemed to spawn from uh, from this kind of putting the spotlight on it so that was you know really fulfilling to see some some impact in that I uncovered something that that was maybe looking to take advantage of people and already had and was able to shine a light on that and put a stop to it. Uh, you can go to the next one. And I, I, we're going to have till? We have until 120, oh. 125. OK, so cool. I just want to make sure I leave enough time for, for questions, because I'm kind of. Also in Bozeman, uh, I got to cover the ski industry. And I'm a snowboarder. I also teach snowboarding. Um, and so they said, yeah, you can. You got to do these outdoors columns. So do whatever you want. And so I said, I want to go snowboarding at this little ski area. So 
I called up the manager who was a young guy about my age and said, hey, I want to come do a story. And he's like, yeah, that's great. We'll, we'll go out and we'll ride. And I went out there and we just snowboarded all day and I wrote a story about it and I took a bunch of photos. And, uh, and, I, and like, I look back and I read the story and I like the story still so I feel like, you know, I did some decent work and people are interested in this. And, um, you know, and it's, I mean, Montana's a, got all kinds of little ski areas like this. So this is a really fun thing to do. You can go ahead and go to wherever's next. So I'm in Bozeman. I see that Seattle PI has a job opening. And so I immediately apply for it. Uh, I get on LinkedIn and I'm like, who do I know? Who knows someone there? And it turns out our photo editor at Sketch Valley Herald uh, was connected to some people there. And so I said, hey, can you, you know, put in a good word for me? And then another uh, former professor pinged me from Western and said, you should apply for this. And I said, I already did. So uh, he said, I said, can you, you know, say something nice about me to them? And, and he said, yeah, yeah, I will. And so I, uh, so I was actually traveling and I got a call from them and they wanted to interview me and I happened to be flying back through Seattle so I could, so I rerouted my flight a little bit to give me, myself a day. I interviewed on a Tuesday on, and on Friday they hired me and they described a job that I didn't really know how to do. They wanted me to cover business and culture in Seattle which I said sure, I know how to do that. I've been covering business, I know culture, I'm a music guy. But they said, but they don't have a print product, right? I, I had just started school when the print paper ended. And so they're like, you gotta be thinking about SEO, search engine optimization. You gotta be thinking about social media a lot bigger than you have before. You gotta be getting stuff out quickly. You're gonna have to do other things like build slideshows and you're gonna have to package stories and you're gonna have to look at your traffic and see how, much, how many readers are viewing your stories and how long they're spending on your stories. And you're gonna have to, use all of this data and information to figure out how to better cover, cover the city. And it was really challenging. I, I think I spent the first year feeling like I didn't have my feet under me. Uh, I, I, was, I would have a good month and feel like, yeah, I've got this figured out. I, I wrote some good stories and I've got great numbers and people are interested. And then I would have a month where I would go into my meeting with my boss and say, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to do this job. This is too hard what have you. And I think this is really uh, where I got my eyes open to the challenges facing journalism today. And these challenges have doubled up since. Uh, as some of you may or may not know, the PI recently lost a number of staff. We had uh, several positions eliminated and several more people resigned. So while there were a dozen of us uh, three months ago, there are five of us now. So that has shifted some things pretty rapidly. Um, I'm sort of, for the moment, handling some uh, oversight, managing editor type duties because they're, we don't, they fired all our bosses or they resigned. Uh, we're, owned, we're owned by Hearst, but we're under the San Francisco Chronicle and SF Gate, which of course are based in San Francisco. San Francisco. Sorry. And, uh, so there are th these challenges, but this all is part of this, like, what do you do? Because the, the thing that we do is we, we have always looked at, at traffic, and when I say traffic, I mean a number of users on the page or number of page views or how much time people are spending on pages. And this is a dangerous kind of place for a journalist to get into because you move a little farther away from just trying to tell the best story to trying to tell the best story that the most people are going to read. And that can put you in a challenging position. You're, you have ethics. You, you sort of set out with this duty that I'm going to cover this community really well and I'm going to tell these important stories. But then someone says, but if you don't make your numbers, we're going to have to find someone else to do the job. So it has been really challenging and it's getting more challenging. Uh, we, you know, we have so few people, it's, we're still figuring out how we're even gonna cover the city. But along the way, I've gotten to do some really interesting work. Uh, I know Chip said I cover business and transportation. I also have written a lot about the Seattle music scene. I've written a ton about homelessness. Uh, I've written about housing and, uh, and real estate. This is one of the pieces I'm most proud of doing. I've done a lot of homelessness coverage. Uh, this was the, if you're familiar with the jungle, it's about a two and a half mile stretch under I-5 where people have lived for decades. Uh, they were clearing it after there was a shooting there 
in 2016, and uh, you know they're going to clear it once and for all, which I'm not sure that that has necessarily been the case. But we had written about a lot of things, and we said we need to get out there into this camp and see what the, the deal is. So myself and a photographer went out, and uh, we just walked around and talked to people, and uh, you know it was kind of a scary thing, as people would say, "This is the most dangerous place in the city," and you know I don't think you should be here, or would be very angry if we were got a little too close into their business. Uh, but this is a story that when, you, when it's told the right way, which is a complicated explanation, I guess, that I can't answer, it, uh, it hits home and, and people read this stuff too. I mean, it's an important story. I think it's important. You probably all think it's an important story to tell. And when we did this story and when we did a, a lot of these stories, we saw a lot of people on the page reading about this stuff. Uh, you can go ahead and you can open up a, another something. So that's a story that I keep trying to figure out how to tell and how to tell in a way that's new and fresh and that gets at the issues and the changing issues because all of these things keep changing. The city is getting more funding or you know, they're increasing their budget. They're trying to raise more money. So it's a pretty complicated, uh, pretty complicated equation to figure out, well, what's the next, what's the next important story without retreading some of the same storylines? Um, this is another uh, story I did uh, not that long ago, although I worked on it through several stories over the course of last year. Uh, if you're familiar with Pioneer Square at all, the J&M Cafe and Card Room is a pretty famous old uh, bar and restaurant down there. And uh, this started with an apartment owner raising people's rents 121% over at a Lake Union apartment building. And I wrote, wrote a couple stories about that. And when I started digging into the companies behind that, I found this sort of web of these real estate LLCs, which is how you do real estate business. Uh, you form an LLC for a development or whatever. And I found this one company behind all of them that was this real estate investment firm, except that when I called the state, they weren't registered with the state. So it turns out that they could have been operating under an exception, but they weren't. And my story that I wrote at that time triggered a state investigation, which then got them uh, fined and sanctioned and basically shuttered their investment business. Didn't help the investors who had given them a few million dollars, but uh, did put a stop to it. And then uh, also out of that, a contractor who worked for them called me up and said, hey, they didn't pay me for 150 grand worth of work. And so was able to tell that story. So even while I've been in this challenging job where I'm trying to figure out how do I get these page views, how do I get people on the site? And trust me, I love to showcase this work, but I do think, I build slideshows all the time. I'll go, I'll get a wallet hub survey and I'll build a 15 slide gallery and I'll write a couple of paragraphs and backload with some stuff that, from reporting I've done and just kick that out. And that's like page view fodder. And it's not something that I really set out to do. It's not why I went to journalism school. It's not, uh, it's not why I have thousands of dollars of student debt. But it's, it's the place that I'm in. I have, to, I have to balance, I have to pay for myself with that so I can do this work, which also, by the way, does great traffic. I mean, this stuff, people want to read about sc scandal. And uh, so it, it's, a really, it's a really challenging position to be in, to, to kind of want to do this mostly and you know, tell the story of homelessness in Seattle, tell the story of what Am how Amazon and the tech boom has changed Seattle, uh, and then also figure out, well, how do I get, how do I you know, make my goal of of X number of page views. How do I get this number of users to come to our site? So uh, those challenges are not getting any easier, obviously, and I'm still figuring that out. Uh, but you know, I'm still I'm still happy with journalism. I still think it's really important. I think all organizations are facing the similar questions, except for nonprofits, who have deep enough pockets that they never have to care about advertising or or you know eyes to the page. Uh, so to speak, but I think the question of getting readers to look at your stuff is one that we've always had to answer and I don't think we've answered it well in the past because we haven't had as much pressure to sort of figure it out. Newspapers, you, you'd have this, how many newspapers did someone pick up from a box? And you'd say, we did really well with that story because people picked up this many newspapers, but that doesn't really tell you what they read. That doesn't tell you that they spent 
two minutes on this story on average while they spent half a minute on another story or whatever. So I think that thinking about these things, looking at how many people are reading, how long they're reading, is really valuable in figuring out where we're going and, and what stories are hitting home for people, but it also it is, uh, it risks abuse in the wrong way by those with short-term interests in just making a quick buck. So, uh, I don't know, that, so uh, what, what else do you have there, real quick, before I, I'll give you guys time to ask whatever you want to ask. Uh, put up that Chris Cornell story. This is a just shameless self-promotion. I uh, was really, really proud of uh, some, my colleagues asked me to write a, uh, an obituary and a tribute for Chris Cornell when he passed uh, last year and felt this tremendous amount of pressure because this is, you know, Soundgarden was a band that I, that I grew up with and as a musician it was a big influence on me. And so uh, spent, the, spent several days interviewing people who, who had known Chris Cornell and wrote this story. And, um, and I'm just uh, really proud of it. I just think it's a good, it's a good uh, encompassing of, of what, what he meant to Seattle and probably, you know, to the whole region and to a lot of people who aren't in Seattle. But anyway, um, just another sort of piece of some of the stuff that I get to do. So you guys should ask me some questions. You can just like that, whatever you got. What kinds of stories um, or arenas in which stories reside that you feel should be covered but you're not able to because of the low readership numbers? Uh, I would say, so that's, that's, I don't want to say because of low readership. I want to say because there's sort of this idea that if the, right pe if the right person reads one story, that that can have an impact. But certainly, I would like to spend more time on some of these issues. I'd like to spend more time writing about homelessness. I'd like to spend more time working on the stories. Uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to spend some time on some of these stories, but uh, you know, where I might spend a couple of weeks as I'm working on other things, I might want to spend a month and just work on that. Uh, there are, I, there have been many stories that I've started working on that have just sort of gotten shuffled aside because I have to kind of feed the beast. And I think that's, that's sort of the biggest challenge here. And, and that goes back to many traditional journalism roles too, is you get stuck feeding the beast and you don't have time for these maybe more important projects. So, you know, the Seattle Times has more resources, although their resources have been dwindling too. So, you know, while they might have, they have two transportation reporters, for example. I'm the only person at the PI who covers transportation. They have multiple business reporters. I'm the only one who covers sort of business issues. They have, uh, you know, a, a project of team covering homelessness. I cover homelessness. So it's that lack of resources and just being spread out. Well, you got to build a slideshow. You got to do this. You got to do that. So it's very hard to get some of those, you know, spend the kind of time that I feel an issue deserves. Does that? No, I'm just thinking what, what sorts of, um, when I say arenas, what, what kinds of issues out there do you feel are not being brought to the public eye um, because of this pressure for? for um, being able to support the business. You know, you were talking about nonprofits. And I mean, I read like High Country News is one of my favorite publications. Love it, publications. got a couple friends yeah. who work there. Yeah, and I think of publications like that that are able to bring some things to a readership who cares about that content area but maybe don't make it to more mainstream media news. And I'm wondering what kinds of things you're seeing in our area that if you worked for a nonprofit, for example, you would like to see in the public eye that are not getting out there. I well, mean, it, it seems to me you probably have an insight on a lot of things that most of us don't because of I your think, experience and your position. I think there are a lot of, uh, so the one part of that is that there are a lot of stories that we don't know about because I, nobody has time to dig into them. Uh, a good example, uh, David Croman over at Crosscut, who's a great reporter and does great work, and Crosscut does some great work. Uh, he recently wrote about um, issues of, uh, of pay inequity 
in the city of Seattle and how uh, even though they had touted that women are paid the same, it actually doesn't work out because women don't get as much overtime because they're not in roles that tend to get more overtime. And this is something where he just requested a bunch of records, dug through them, found the data, and then told the story. And it wasn't a story that he, he might have heard rumblings about it, and I, you know, I've heard those kind of rumblings, but that's the kind of story that, that I would want to dig. I would want to go chase something like that. Like my story about the nonprofit fraud. I was just sitting at my desk, not working on anything, just looking through databases. And that's something that when you don't have the time and the resources to do that, those stories don't get told. I think there are a lot of stories at City Hall that could be told that aren't being told because people don't have time to work on them. So, for example, but so. Um, and there was a question back there. Hey, um, oh, sorry. Um, so my questions were related to the programs that you used. So you said you used, I mean, for for your web journalism, right, or sure. IT journalism. Um, what were the programs you used? You used SEO Search Engine, or what was it called again? Oh, so SEO is a search engine optimization. That's not a program. It's a, it's basically the idea that you, uh, you make you, you make your store try to get your stories to appear in search. I mean, Google is the we call it the Google Juice. When you get the Google Juice, you have won. Um, but through uh, keywords in a headline, keywords in a lead. Uh, Sometimes tagged keywords in the um, in the back end can be effective, but so that's just the you know base the catch-all for how do you get your stories to show up in search. So, what other uh, programs do you use now to utilize that to push for your stories to be read, like on the web? Do I you mean, try to go for a, you know, a, a viral approach? Is that what you try to do to have more traffic onto your web page? I mean, I'm well, just asking. For yeah, that. I mean, I guess I. I don't use any specific program. I, I try to load, like for instance, every story I write if I can, I get Seattle, Seattle in a headline and in a lead and in a photo caption because that's going to help with search for people searching Seattle stories. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I have the opportunity, I'm always writing headlines to try to get people's attention. I don't want to write a, a total clickbait headline, but I certainly want to write a headline that's going to make you go, what is that? Or, or that's crazy or whatever it might be. So. For instance, if I write a weather story, uh, which I do a lot of also, uh, it's better to say there's going to be two feet of snow in the mountains than to say a lot of snow will fall in the mountains or whatever it might be, because people like to see a number. Uh, Seattle, like the term Seattle weather in a, um, in a URL is, is more valuable than, than some other things. So it's just stuff like that and learning how to, really just learning how to, how to load that stuff in there to make sure that it shows up. And is and is there any other programs you use besides SEO? I mean, what other programs do you use? I, I mean, I don't use any programs specifically to do that other than, I mean, I use some, uh, we use some social, uh, like social, social feed programs that sort of feed into our social media accounts that is more for tracking than for, uh, than for that kind of thing. So it tags things so we know how many people get on them. Um, yeah, you had mentioned that this kind of gives you a unique insight into where we're going with having to um, optimize people, what people look at and what people want to see. Um, so I'm just curious, like, what's your, like, where do you see us going? You, you know, I'm just interested. Well, I think that uh, certainly on a national level, the news recently has lent uh, has lent itself well to uh, just driving traffic because the headlines are pretty scandalous all the time. Um, so it's sort of like you don't have to try that hard when the news is that crazy. Uh, I think that it's hard to guess. I mean, I would like to think that the, that the approach of deeply researched, deeply reported, impactful journalism is going to win out over low-hanging fruit, cheap clicks, make money now and not care about the future. Um, but you know those two things are battling each other a little bit. Uh, maybe you know we're seeing a lot of good journalism coming out of the big mainstays, the Washington Post, New York Times. Uh, you know the Associated Press continues to do really well. But 
those organizations are outliers. And every time someone says, oh, well, the New York Times figured out subscriber model, and so everyone else just do that, it doesn't work that way because you don't have the economy of scale. You can't do that at the Seattle PI or at the Seattle Times, for that matter. Uh, you know, the Seattle Times is going after subscribers now. That's their model. They're not chasing page views. They're chasing subscribers because they, you know, they never had, they never did. Newspapers did, I mean, they didn't have to try because they were the source and now they're not. So they got to figure out how to do it and their avenue, their advertising revenues are shrinking. So, um, God, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the Times is doing a pretty good job there. They seem to think the really good local coverage is getting them subscribers. So hopefully that's the case. Last question. Oh, just Last a question. He, he has a question too. I'm just curious your career ambitions. What's next or where do you see your future going? Uh, that's, a, that's a tough one to answer. I'm, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. So I don't really know. I, I'm really interested in good in doing local journalism. Um, I've done a lot of data reporting in the past, and I'm interested in maybe doing more of that. Um, I'd really like to be able to do more like data investigative work as as sort of my sole thing than just kind of everything. So um, we'll see. Did you got time for? Um, I know that you had a lucrative job before, but at that moment, what kind of gave you the courage to switch over or transition in your life? I was really burned out. I don't know. I mean, I may, maybe not courage, maybe arrogance, really. I, I, <laughs> um, I felt like a, an education was going to be valuable to me no matter what. and. I just felt like what I had been doing wasn't fulfilling me, and so I, you know, just like a, like a white man in America, I said, whatever, I'm going to do something different. I mean, I, that's a joke, but like, I feel like, you know, I'm in the best position to succeed, right? You know, because I've got all this, you know, unearned privilege going for me. So, um, so it was arrogance, really, and and then it turned out that I was also a very hard worker, and I, you know, was able to become a really good student and do very well at that, and then you know, show that I could do good work. And so, um, but it was kind of scary. I mean, uh, when I moved over here, I had no idea how I was going to, I didn't know how I was going to get money. I didn't know if I was going to get financial aid. I didn't know if I was going to get unemployment. I didn't know what I was going to do. I'd spent all my money to move over here. I had left my home behind, you know, across the pond, but whatever. I didn't have a lot to jump into. So, um, so I just, you know, pushed. I'm curious if you have any advice for the students that are here today about either what they should take advantage of here at Shoreline. Are there classes or programs or lessons you learned here that they should pursue or be sure to get while they're here that you feel like helped you in your, um, in your journey to where you are now? Well, they should take your class. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Um, well, I mean, you know, that's, that's not really a joke because uh, I, I, for, I forget what the title of your class. Okay, it was different at the time. But at any rate, when I took your class, uh, that really, I was, I had grown up kind of in a rural community on the peninsula and had a pretty limited view of what the heck was happening in the world. And that, uh, you know, opened my eyes to a lot of things, to a lot of issues of diversity and privilege and all these things that have been really powerfully uh, important for me as a journalist because I have to go into stories aware of these issues. Otherwise, I'll look like that a-hole who wrote the story from a position of power and privilege and didn't consider any of the people who weren't in that position. So I think stuff like that. I took, uh, I took uh, international political economy with uh, Chip and Kenny and were you in on that at the time, Larry? Tim and Terry, Tim, uh, Tim Payne, Terry Taylor ran on that. I took uh, Bob Francis. Yeah. Uh, so I took the the two of those classes, and those were really influential in getting a way better understanding of uh, of the global sort of dynamics that are happening, and getting me interested in politics and political science more in a a. a, a 
the word's escaping me, in a thoughtful way rather than as a, a sport, as it sort of so often is portrayed. Um, those led me to get a minor in political science too. So you know, um, and I think work in terms of being a reporter, working on the newspaper was really important. But I don't think that those skills are just skills that will translate to being a reporter. Those are skills that will translate to all kinds of careers and jobs where you might have to go and approach people who are strangers or cold call people or figure out how to uh, discern a short story out of a bunch of complicated information. And um, I think that's one of the most valuable skills you learn as a journalist is you learn things all the time and then you have to figure out how to tell that back to people in a way that they can understand it simply and quickly and how it's going to impact them rather than this, you know, maybe an 1100 page budget document or, or what have you. Thank you guys so much for having me. And, uh... Thank you, Dan.